Health Minister Mark Holland is with us now. Hi, Minister. Great to have you back on the show. Thanks for making the time. Thanks, Fashi. I have a number of questions about the money you announced with Ontario late last week, but I actually wanted to start off on sort of some of the political things that went on in the Hill, in particular, the leader of the NDP this week, Jagmeet Singh, saying that he's put the Prime Minister on notice, that there will be repercussions if the government, your government, doesn't introduce the Pharmacare bill by March 1st. You're the lead on that file. Will the bill be introduced by then? Yes, I have every confidence it will be. Uh, you know, I, I appreciate uh, negotiations aren't easy, and some of that uh, spills out um, uh, publicly. Uh, but Don Davies has been a great partner to work with. Uh, we've had a lot of back and forth. Uh, we knew each other well back when we were both critics, uh, but we're getting to know each other a lot better, obviously, as we work through dental and pharmacare and other issues. Uh, so I'm, I'm confident that we'll be able to find a solution and that we'll have legislation tabled before that deadline. You said this week that, quote unquote, we can't afford this to be a massively expensive program. It's against that backdrop that I wanted to ask bluntly. Will you be introducing a legislative framework for single payer universal ph pharmacare? Well, you know, I understand that, that folks want to jump to what it is. Um, it's still being debated uh, and I'm not in a position at this point to be able to go into detail. What I can say is that, um, and I've said this from the beginning, the, the, the legislation we're introducing is framework legislation. It's not the end state. Um, we had in British Columbia uh, and have a, P a, a pilot that has been working incredibly successfully. Uh, most of what's out there is done in models. Uh, so being able to demonstrate in the real world um, what's effective and what works um, and how do we improve things incrementally. Uh, we can't do everything at once, uh, I think is a, is a fair thing to say. I take your point on that. I guess I wonder as the Federal Minister of Health, do you believe the end state should be single-payer universal pharmacare? Well, I think the end state uh, has to be that every person uh, everywhere in the country is covered and ha is able to afford their drugs. I take from that answer, though, in the language you use, that you maybe necessarily don't believe that it has to be single-payer, for example. Well, I'm not ideologically bound to any one option. I think that what we have to do is take a look um, as we're moving through this process. And this is part of the conversation we're having with the NDP, um, you know, what the best model is and how we get there. And uh, I'm, you know, I think when uh, we table legislation, I'll be able to be in a position to have a deeper conversation. Uh, but these are reflections that I've given all along. Uh, do you feel that the deal between your party and the New Democrats still serves your party? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I think that I was the House leader before I was in this position. Uh, and it's a great starting point. It doesn't mean that we work with the New Democrats on everything. Sometimes we work with other parties, um, but it creates um, predictability. Mr. Singh does keep, though, on occasion, threatening, like I said off the top, repercussions or threatening you know, that there will be some consequence if some condition isn't met. Your party isn't making the same kinds of threats. Do you think it's fair for Canadians to intimate from that, if the deal does break apart, it will likely be because of the NDP withdrawing, not your party? Well, I just, it's not how I operate. Um, you know, you, you might recall, Vashi, I mean, when I was House Leader for a couple of years, and there were a lot of really difficult negotiations. And over that two-year period, I was asked, you know, many times a week, is this going to be the end of Parliament? Is this going to be the end of the Supply and Confidence Agreement? And I never speculated on it. I just don't think it's useful. Um, I understand that it, you know, creates headlines and attention and uh, it could be used as a negotiating tactic, but I, I don't think, you know, Canadians want us pulling that fire alarm. I, I think where Canadians want us to have the conversation on solutions, on what we're trying to do, what we're trying to work on, as opposed to engaging in, you know, hypotheticals that, you know, are, are mostly not going to pan out that way in my experience. Well, we can do both. So I'm going to move on to uh, policy and in particular the announcement you made alongside uh, your provincial counterpart in Ontario, $3.1 billion over the next three years. It's the money that was initially, uh, you know, part of what was announced almost exactly a year ago when your government agreed to increase essentially health transfers to provinces that had been demanding it for a really long time. Why did it take a year for this money to get out the door, especially since the, the, the stuff that it's going to, family doctor shortages, mental health access, have all ge been getting worse, not better in the interim? Well, you know, I think uh, over the last six months, uh, you know, this has been my top priority is working on these agreements with different provinces. 
but making sure that we get it right. These are uh, these are ten year agreements. The ones that we announced are a three year component of it. And one of the things that's happening for the first time, which is extremely difficult, is for every province to have common indicators so that we can all see in our health system exactly how we're doing and how provinces are doing relative to each other. Having those metrics are huge, and they're not easy uh, to getting common metrics across the country. Uh, and making sure that we have plans that are as robust as possible to meet the challenges that are in front of us. Well, I want to ask about one of those indicators and one of those metrics, because I think it really hits home for you know Canadians, not just in Ontario, but outside, 6 million of whom right now can't find a family doctor. In Ontario, the number is 2.2 million. That's the most recent run I could find. Can you be clear about the strings attached to this money. So for example, at the end of the three years, the $3.1 billion, how many Ontarians will have a family doctor? Yeah, so there, there, there are, we set out targets. Um, Ontario is hiring a huge number of doctors. I believe it's, uh, uh, you know, it, the hundreds of doctors in this agreement. Um, and I think the key is uh, then to be able to show in metrics how we're making progress against that. But I say Ontario and other provinces have been great partners. I take your point on, on what you're saying, Minister, but I also feel, and I, and I felt this listening to the press conference as well, when the Health Minister of Ontario was, you know, talking about all the, the, the progress that they've made, I feel like to people listening, it sounds incredibly incremental. I know you said that this agreement leaves room for progress. There are hundreds of doctors who will be hired, but I still don't hear any metric at the end of that term, that three years, that, you know, uh, 500,000 fewer Ontarians will be waiting for a primary care doctor. Like, how are we to hold either your government to account or Ontario's government to account if we don't know what strings specifically are attached to that money? The, the truth is, uh, I think what people want to see is, is rapid progress. Uh, yes. They don't expect miracles overnight, but that's what they're going to see. They're going to see a rapid improvement in the system. And these indicators are going to allow them to see that, not just in how they feel when they go into a health system and have an improved outcome, but also in data. And we know there are parts of our health system that are working phenomenally. I go to children's hospitals in the country talking to parents you know, it used to be 30% chance of survival when you walked into a cancer ward as a child. Uh, now that's up to 70% chance of survival. You don't pay a dime and you get service instantly. You know, there's all kinds of parts of our health system that are working phenomenally. We have some of the best elements of our health system in the world, yeah, but, to, but we have other areas that are in crisis yeah. and are being challenged, and, and that's what we're tackling. Pardon the interruption, because I, I, I don't think by raising the concerns that Parents, for example, in the ERs of those same hospital face when they wait on average 15 or 16 hours to get their kid who's having an anaphylactic reaction to be seen is discounting the progress that's being made in other areas. But no. what happens, for example, if there isn't progress or if there are even more Ontarians without primary care? Does that mean that the government money will stop flowing from, from your end to their end? Like, are there any... Is there any accountability in that vein, or will it just keep going and the system keep persisting the way it is? No, one of the reasons that we, this is, these are 10 year deals, uh, but we're doing them three years at a time with data and analytics to see how the systems are improving. And of course, I talk to my provincial uh, and territorial counterparts every day, and I see my role to be a convener uh, to help provide solutions here that what something's working in Nova Scotia, maybe we could try it in Alberta, something's working in Alberta, maybe we could try it in Ontario, um, to try to bring everybody together and be a convener. And I have to say, the spirit that I've met um, is one of, let's pull in the same direction. Okay, Minister, I'm out of time. I'll leave it there. I appreciate your time as always. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick.